ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize uh, for that uh, slight technical issue. Uh, it's been resolved now. Uh, we still have our uh, Dr. Charles uh, back online. So, you, uh, Dr. Charles, you're talking about HRT. I mean, for me, that's quite, quite surprising because I thought HRT was a, a form of treatment that, uh, that actually helped in other areas of uh, uh, females' health or something. Yes, it does. It does. It does. Uh, you know, what we tell women is every treatment has its possible risk. And that's why it has to be taken with uh, supervision. And uh, we usually would advise HRC to be limited to five years of use generally. Uh, it could be used for longer, but it's all about reviewing the individual using it. And, it, and it's the estrogen only HRT. So it does have its risk, but when you balance the risk compared with um, the benefits that you are in the best position to decide on whether you want to use that or not. Uh, so, blanketly, we say it increases the risk, but by how much is the issue? So, it, it's uh, not uh, a significant rise in that risk when it's used for a period of, of about five years. For a period of five years, okay. Now, there's something you mentioned, because we, we talked about uh, cervical cancer um, and the, you know, the, the, the trend here is that a lot of uh, screening is happening to pick up the signs or, you know, of, of any cell, uh, you know, that might be displaying uh, kind of, um, you know, attributes of a, of a, of a uh, you know, cervical cancer early stage sign. But we are in the pandemic. And there's been a lot of a pushback on on um, routine operations. Uh, a lot of things have been put on hold due to the pandemic. You know, how do you think this has affected uh, the process of of a uh, you know that screening that the NHS does to ensure that you know this disease is picked up early? Because yes, we did. You did mention earlier on the show that uh, the data shows that there's there's been a decrease or decline in cases for cervical cancer. But now that there's no screening happening, um, how, you know, do people test themselves? Is it possible to test yourselves? Is it, you know, what, what kind of a early signs can you pay attention to and say, you know what, maybe something is going wrong for cervical cancer uh, for now? Yeah. All right, Dr. Nine, again, a very good question. The pandemic revealed a lot of things and... Um, we're only now just trying to get back on track, getting back onto what's normal. Uh, I know that a number of ladies had their appointments deferred and they couldn't get screened. Uh, it's important that we get back to the screening schedule for women. Uh, the good thing about cervical cancer is oh, women who have been keeping to date with their cervical screening program, if your last screening was normal, then chances are that you know, by the next time you get screened for women who are less than 50, so they get their screening done every three years. And uh, the, the rough year was 20, 2020. Mm. So I know that GP surgeries are getting women in as quickly as possible to resume their screening for those who are due screening. So hopefully not much has been lost. Uh, if the the screening test had been abnormal prior to the pandemic, then those women are quite different because there has been an abnormality de de detected and doctors would have put those patients off. It's because the priority has been given to patients with diagnosed cancer to get their treatment. So either surgeries or referrals on to chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So yes, there has been a lull because of the pandemic, but I know that with in, in, in all, practically all GP surgeries, there's that push to get on with the schedule. Uh, early signs, so the, the things that ladies need to look out for for cervical cancer, any woman who complains of bleeding following sexual intercourse, that is not normal. Mm. So if there's any bleeding with sexual intercourse, it has to be reported to the doctor. She needs to get the cervix examined. The bleeding could be due to, in some instances, a tear in the vaginal wall. It could be due to what we call like an atropion. That's normal uh, changes to cells that line the neck of the womb. But it could also be a telltale sign 
of abnormalities in the cells of the cervix that could be pointers to early stage, like a cancer or, you, or even late stage. So don't take it for granted, oh, I just had a little bleed. If it's happened once, it's happened twice, then you need to report that to the doctor. The cervix needs to be examined. In most instances, there will be nothing wrong, but it's important that uh, abnormalities are excluded. And by the time a lady starts complaining about abnormal discharge, which is foul smelling, then, and this is the presentation we get mostly in uh, the developing world, in Africa, in Asia, where things are not developed, then those are signs of late on, late onset disease. By the time a woman is having profuse discharge from the vagina with a foul odor, then it's probably too late to do something significant. Wow. But it, 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 it's, it's important to mention any bleeding with sexual intercourse, abnormal discharge, weight loss, you know, discomfort in the pelvis, it's important that those things get checked out. That's what's the record cancer. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I, I am, I am uh, taking all this in as well, and I hope uh, my listeners are uh, making notes as well. And it's not, it's not to, you know, get you paranoid or get you you know worried or scared you know the because the, the quicker you uh know uh the better and the ch better chances of uh, treating this illness i mean i go back again uh to the lady uh who was young i think she was about 28 years old and she didn't pay attention to the signs i guess because what happened was there was a quick deterioration of you know herself you know body loss of you know better body weight loss um quite drastic you know where she lost her hair and unfortunately she passed on uh, as well okay so we know the early signs um of cervical cancer what kind of symptoms comes with this with the signs uh could you take that question again sorry the line was very clear come with the signs so you have bleeding okay so you're bleeding yeah. as well you have a bit of discharge you know foul order uh, you, you have a bit of weight loss uh, coming up because now a lot of people are going to be making making assumptions that oh maybe oh my gosh maybe I, I'm I'm you know maybe it was just that that time it was rough um, that's why I'm bleeding um, maybe I, I do it gently next time maybe I use some uh, um, you know some lubricants. lubricants you know maybe maybe that was why uh, oh discharge oh my gosh maybe I didn't wash myself properly that's why it's such because you know a lot of people you know we make mistake uh, not you know we make um excuses in our head to not look at the you know the true nature of what the actual problem is you know weight loss oh okay maybe i'm not eating properly or maybe i need to eat more and maybe that's this is why this is why it's happening but what are the symptoms you know are coupled with this early signs or signs or cervical cancer all right uh so largely what I've said about the signs, so we could, you know, say those are also symptoms as well for cervical like cancer. And it's important that one doesn't get paranoid. Mm. But at the same time, if you, if you observe something that is out of your normal, that you should let your GP know about it. And then you could take it on from there. The GP could either reassure or ask that you come in to get reviewed. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, from the age of 25 in the UK, um, ladies get invited to have their cervical cancer screen for the first time, okay? And thereafter, they have it done every three years until the age of 49, and then they have it every five years. So once that screening is done, then it, 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 it's been a very good way of actually picking up cervical cancer early. Now, it's important to mention that over 99% of cases of cervical cancer are due to an infection by a virus called HPV. That's a human papilloma virus. Wow. Uh, so that's a large number where you look at 99.8% actually. So it's, it, it, in the UK, 99.8% of cervical cancers are preventable. So or almost 100% cases of cervical cancer are preventable. And that's because, one, there is a vaccination program. So we're going back to vaccines. Yeah. You know, a vaccination program where uh, young girls and now boys aged 12 to 13 
are given the HPV vaccine, that's the human papillomavirus vaccine. So the, the idea is to get the vaccination in before they become sexually active. Mm. Okay? So, and that has led to the development of antibodies against the HPV, which is the primary cause of cervical cancer. Right. And by the time screening comes on board, so we stand a very good chance of picking this up at the very early stage. The HPV infection is very common, but the chances that it will persist and then progress to cervical cancer is very low because most instances of HPV infection in 6 to 12 months would resolve on its own. But there are some uh, behaviors that would increase risk. You know, we've talked about smoking, and it's actually been found that in women who have their first sexual intercourse less than the age of 14, so if they're less than 14 years old, where there's a lot of change in the cells happening in the cervix, you know, around the cervix, uh, their risk increases by two. So there's a double increase in their risk of having cervical cancer compared to if they had their first uh, intercourse, their sexual debut, you know, above the age of 25. Wow. And also things like um, high parity. So in places where there's a high premium place on having children, women who have five, six, seven children, you know, they are at an increased risk of having cervical cancer compared to women who have one or two. Mm. Because each time a woman is pregnant, carries that pregnancy on, you know, the cervix dilates, she gives birth, there is that, you know, those changes that happen to the neck of the womb. And each time cells divide and multiply, there is a chance that they would get out of their regulated control and lead on to cancer. Because cancer is just uh, uncontrolled cell growth. So these are risk factors. But double nine, what worries me is actually ovarian cancer. Yes, I think we should talk about that now because... Right now, I, I am so, you know, consumed with a lot of information now, you know, because I, 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 we need that to be able to educate the generation behind us, our children, and also ourselves as well. Because a lot of this information, possibly a lot of people were not aware. I can say, for instance, HPV. Um, I don't even know what H- HPV was. You know, I've, I've heard of HPV. I've heard of the, um, you know, there's a vaccine about it, but I didn't never really knew, know what it did or what it, it could cause. I mean, but before we move on to the um, ovarian cancer, which is quite important because you talked about there's no screening in place for that. You know, with HPV, how easy is it to contract, you know, the virus? The HPV virus is, is, is a very interesting virus. You know, uh, we're taught back then in, in medical school, you know, with the use of barrier contraception, that's with the use of the condom, mm. okay, there is uh, that protection against HIV, you know. Yes. And interestingly, you don't really get people talking so much about HIV these days. Because, you know, we've learned, you know, using the condom, you know, protection, you know, safe sex and all that. But even with the use of the condom, there is still the risk of transmission of HPV. Wow. Because it's all, it's, it's not just bodily fluid. It's about, you know, the region around the groin where there's contact. Mm. So it, it, it's very possible that one uses a condom, but HPV is still contracted. So it's uh, quite common, and, you know, there's a lot of changes, you know, in the 21st century. You know, women, uh, young girls, sexual debut less than 14. So when, when a lady that young has sexual intercourse, you know, there's that increased risk, and she's unlikely to be using protection, depending on what information or education she's had. And uh, also, when you look at ladies less than the age of 18 with their first pregnancy, that's also an increased risk of cervical cancer. So, first pregnancy less than the age of 18 compared to when it happens above the age of 24, 25. So, all these are, you know, observations that have been picked up, and the data is all there. So, uh, but that's the HPV. The, the HPV 
you know, most people would get the infection and it leads to nothing. You know, you, without going too much into the technical details, yeah. you have the high risk type and then you have the low risk type. You must have heard of genital warts. Yes. Right? Yes. So genital warts are caused by the low risk form of HPV. Wow. You know, but the high risk form of HPV will cause the cancer. Okay, and but ladies who have got genital warts are at an increased risk mm. of then contracting the high risk form of the HPV. You know, so it's it's just important to be aware that it's definitely without uh, barrier contraception, then the, the risk is very high. Yeah, barrier contraception reduces the risk, but it's also important that vaccination is um, is taken when it's due. So in, in young girls, young boys, the age of 12, 13, they get vaccinated. So that's important. And we have come to realize that being vaccinated helps against childhood um, diseases, against you know, the, the, this big one now, COVID-19, yeah. and we've got vaccination for other conditions like um, the HPV. Amazing. Okay, just before we move on to the ovarian cancer, I, I really want us to move on to that. But with HPV, you mentioned about, you know, the, the low level and the high level uh, forms of the virus. Yeah, you know, the high risk and then the low risk form. And the low risk form of it. So are they both linked to the hygiene of an individual? So the hygiene doesn't really come into place with uh, cervical cancer, you know, but for women who, there's something about the ecosystem in the vagina, okay? Mm. It's important because it, as, uh, you know, as uh, squeamish as, as this may sound, you've got bacteria present in the vagina which, which are normal, you know, uh, which help to fight against the infection. So if uh, women have practices like douching and using cleaning agents and disturbing, you know, that ecosystem in, in the vagina, the natural defense uh, mechanism that should put out infections may be affected, and that would predispose ladies to having um, in, in, infections. It, it, it doesn't apply to the HPV as such. So, because it's a virus, and, uh, but the defense system where, where we ladies have lactobacilli, they usually fight against bacteria. So, uh, I don't really think hygiene really plays a role, but definitely things like smoking, um, sexual exposure. Interestingly, it, it's mentioned in data, women who have had uh, sexual partners six, seven or more are at an increased risk compared to those who have had just one sexual partner. So it's it, it's all about the lifestyle. It's all about the lifestyle. Amazing. Thank you for uh, being a uh, you know clarity uh, to that as well. Okay, ovarian cancer. This one, you know, you, there's no screening in place. Um, is as deadly as cervical cancer, or maybe even more deadly. Who knows? So with this, yeah. anyone listening to us today, um, you know, this afternoon, sorry, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, what do they need to worry about? So, ovarian cancer is actually ranked, if, if you were to do a ranking of malignancies, is the sixth most frequently diagnosed cancer in women in the United Kingdom, with one in 50 women having that lifetime risk of having ovarian cancer. Okay? So, uh, and most times it happens sporadically, okay, that there's no family history. Mm. Although in about 15% of people, there would be a genetic link, so either the mom or the sister. So it's important to look out for those things. Now, what I want to mention importantly about ovarian cancer, and this is to help impact the health-seeking behavior of women and also of men, okay, who love women. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if a woman has noticed that, She's got bloating, you know, yeah. that that's just started a week, two weeks, three weeks. She needs to report that to the doctor. Wow. You know, many women will go to the shops, get um, an antacid, and say, oh, it's just gas, it's just wind. 
but this is new to you, okay, especially if you're above the age of 40. We even find it in young ladies as well. So if you notice something different, your bowel habit has changed. You're suffering more from constipation. You're having diarrhea. It's not just right the way you go to the toilet, you know. You're you know, passing urine more frequently. If something's not just right, then you need to report it, okay? If, if, if one has got an acid reflux, you know, it's probably one day, two days, and that's it. But if it's lingering, then mm-hmm. it's important one reports it because the ovarian cancer has non-specific symptoms. Right. And sadly, sadly, over 50% of instances when women present, it's already quite advanced wow. where nothing much could be done. Mm. Okay. Uh, yes, when I say nothing much, you're not looking at cure. Okay. But when it's picked up early, and that's not very common, you know, so that's why it's important. If there's any weight loss, by the time there's weight loss, there's probably something going on, yes. okay? But, but the earlier it's caught, then the better the chances of surviving one year, two years, three years, four years, five years past the time of diagnosis. And each time you have, it's a time to spend with your loved ones and enjoy the rest of one's life. So it's important. You know, a lot of people would just say, I don't want to worry the GP. Mm-hmm. I don't want to, you know, put any strain on anyone. I just want to live my life. But it's important that one seeks for help. If you notice a symptom, particularly bloating, you know, just your bowel habit is changed. You just feel un- uneasy. It's really difficult to articulate what's going on. But, you know, there's something off. What the GP could do is a simple blood test. CA125, do an ultrasound scan, and you're possibly on the way to having a diagnosis early. Wow. Uh, for people who have a family history, I'll quickly touch on that because, yes, there is a genetic link with the like cancer, but more importantly, you know, ovarian cancer, okay? And I have met a couple of ladies who there's a strong history in the family, the mom, the sister, breast cancer, ovarian cancer at an early age. Now, while there's no screening, it's important that these ladies get referred to a geneticist, okay? And they, they should ask those questions of the GP if it's not known, yeah. okay? My mom died of ovarian cancer when she was quite young. My sister diagnosed of ovarian cancer when she was quite young. Could I have a test to see if I've got the gene? It's called the BRCA gene. That's B-R-C-A, you know, the BRCA1, the BRCA2. So in, in 15% of cases of ovarian cancer, it is genetic. Mm. And for those women, they could actually have surgery to deal with the organs that, are, you know, that would lead to cancer eventually, uh, or they could plan on how, of how soon they want to have their kids and then decide to take out the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, uh, because it, it's now recognized that the fallopian tubes is actually where cancer originates from for the ovary, okay? So that's important. I'll quickly mention, you know, uh, things like breastfeeding is actually protective against ovarian cancer. Wow. Yeah, things like breastfeeding and uh, even pregnancy. (laughs) He's trying to get people to start start getting pregnant. No, 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 no. That's why I'm laughing, you know. (laughs) It's very interesting, but, you know, Whatever would stop a woman from ovulating, right, reduces her risk of having ovarian cancer because ovulation would involve cells being released and the surface, you know, the covering over the ovary is disrupted. Mm. So each time ovulation happens and there is a repair of those cells, there is that risk that the cells could move away from their control and start growing uncontrollably, which leads to cancer. You know, that's the uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. I don't want to go too much into um, technical stuff. But so for women who use, like, the oral contraceptive pills, okay, which reduces uh, ovulation, they actually reduce their risk. But, you know, this is all about a balance because, again, the oral contraceptive pills increases the risk of a particular type of cervical cancer. So... It's, but if one goes naturally, and when we talk to women about breastfeeding, 
it's one of those things that we throw in there, you know, that this helps to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer because when you're breastfeeding, particularly when you're breastfeeding exclusively, you wouldn't start ovulating so soon after you've had uh, a baby. Amazing. Amazing. But you know what? There's, you know, you mentioned earlier um, about the uh, pregnancy uh, when concerning the uh, cervical cancer. Uh, because yep. when you have, you know, five, six, seven babies, it increases the chance of you possibly uh, developing uh, cervical cancer. But now we have it that now pregnancy uh, kind of reduces the chance of you having ovarian cancer. It's a bit of a, like, you know, how do you play it? You know, it's, you, know you, you, you talk about, you know, uh, pe people want to have babies, people don't want to have babies. You know, because now you're thinking is ovarian cancer have more babies, uh, cervical cancer have less babies. I mean, as a doctor, as a gynecologist, what would be, what, what would be your advice? Ah, that's a very good question, Dr. Nine. And, um, you know, we're not in a position to say have X number of babies and that balances the risk out. Yeah. If, if you get what I mean, you know, but, but we definitely would say that having higher number of children increases the risk of cervical cancer. But the most important risk factor for for cervical cancer is the HPV, mm -hmm. you know, beyond parity, you know, beyond the number of kids which you have, okay? And there are a lot of factors that go into this, you know, social, economic factors, even health. If a woman isn't healthy, you wouldn't encourage her to go having babies, you know, you know, getting pregnant. So... On balance is, is, is really giving the information to ladies and then they decide. I think most people on average, some would not even want to have a child, you know, for their own reasons. Some would say, okay, I want to do two or three. But it, it's just important to know what you need to look out for and to make sure you don't miss appointments and you make use of health services that are available. Amazing. Okay, the phone lines are open. It's 074-956-36899. This is your chance to speak uh, to the doctor we have here uh, today. You might, you know, never get this uh, chance except you book an appointment at NHS. So number again is 074-956-36899. If you're calling from out of the UK, it's plus 44-74956-36899. You can call me via WhatsApp as well uh, or call me direct on that number. Number again is 74 nine five six three six eight double nine okay now we, you know you mentioned about i asked a question about you know the balances you know having one or two babies having five babies having six babies you know you can't really give a number you can't really advise on that but there's something also common amongst women which is you know the, you know you family planning you know the the ways you talk about the pill the pill could be uh something that could increase uh the chances of ovarian cancer but I mean, are all the methods of family planning, uh, you know, I've heard about, you know, people using injection. I've heard about people using, um, I can't, I don't know what it's called now. Uh, is, it, is it a cord or something? Uh, try to tie off something, you know, to put it in there. I'm not- yeah, the coil. Person. The coil, that's the way it's called. You know, see, I'm not a medical person. I, I try to, to follow this as well. So, I mean, if we look at those family planning methods, you know, apart, you know, we've, we've talked about the pill. Do other family planning methods contribute to the risk of, you know, developing either uh, ovarian cancer or cervical cancer? All right, Dr. Nye, that's, uh, again, a very good, good question. Uh, using the oral contraceptive pill, right, uh, the combined oral contraceptive pill that would reduce uh, the chances of a lady ovulating, so 18%, of ovarian cancers are prevented when the contraceptive pills are used, okay? The, it, it's actually noted that the risk is about 25 to 28% lower, so about a quarter lower in women who have ever used oral contraceptive pills, all right? Yeah. Uh, but for cervical cancer, it's been noted that the risk is slightly increased where the pills are used. Mm. So... Again, on balance, if if a lady is has had all her kids, right, mm -hmm. and that helps to, and she decides, okay, I don't want to have any more kids, and she's getting older, 
then the older you get, then you know that your risk of uh, developing uh, ovarian cancer rises. So you probably would want to do the oral contraceptive pills. And if you've been having your screening, you know, and that's helpful, and the thoracal status is okay, then I think it's reasonable to use the pills if you don't have contraindications to its use because that's something else that you'd need to sit down and discuss either with your GP or with your uh, gynecologist. Um, the other forms like the implants, the injections, whatever would reduce the chances of ovulation would be protective against um, uh, ovarian cancer. cancer. Yeah. So, so none of those family planning methods, you know, could contribute to the risk. They, 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 they wouldn't, they'll be, except for the pill, which you mentioned, a consultation would need to be done before to ensure uh, that, you know, you don't react to it in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, okay. because you have to look at uh, medical conditions or things that may be present in the lady that would um, exclude her from using uh, the contraception in question. Okay, fantastic. Okay, and also, you know, early in the show, you, you know, I asked the question about, you know, what, you know, race, so we talk about the white, uh, the black, uh, the Indian community, uh, who have the higher um, rate of um, cervical cancer, and you mentioned it, it's the white race uh, as well. Is it the same for the ovarian cancer? So ovarian cancer, uh, from data available from... Uh the Cancer Research Group UK. Uh, it's, it's been found to be higher in, in whites, both ovarian cancer and uh, cervical cancer. What I will mention about cervical cancer, though, it's actually the incidence is found to be higher amongst um, deprived populations, mm. okay? So unlike uh, ovarian cancer, where uh, social status or where you are in terms of your bracket in society has no impact, but it, 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 it's been noted that you have higher incidences of uh, cervical cancer amongst those who are poorer, who are more deprived compared to those who are um, well off. Uh, this, I believe, is, a norm, is as a result of a number of factors. Okay, it could l lifestyle, um, availability of services for screening, you know, and you know what we mentioned about smoking. Yeah. Uh, sexual lifestyle and things like that, but, but that, that's uh, what we found from um, research and data. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for giving me that uh, response on that one. So we talk, we, you mentioned in, in the, the deprived areas, it seems to be a higher rate of this type of cancers. And it's been linked to, you know, again, lifestyle, uh, you know, sexual activity and other forms. Is it safe to say that, you know, diet, can be or have a link to you know either an increase in risk or reducing the risk of getting either ovarian cancer or cervical cervical cancer okay so for uh, ovarian cancer uh, i did mention obesity mm. okay being being a major factor or, or one of the factors one of the risk factors for uh, ovarian cancer and I think that will be related to diet as well. So we encourage people to eat, eat healthy, okay? Uh, for cervical cancer, I haven't found any link between diet and um, uh, cervical cancer. If there is, it's not a strong risk, okay? But it's all about the BMI because if you have um, an increased weight, there is the tendency that more estrogen will be produced in, in the fatty tissue, okay? And uh, that in itself would increase, you know, uh, ovulation and then the risk with um, cancer as well. So that's what I would say about diet. We do know that there are certain foods, you know, things that contain antioxidants that would help, you know, to deal with radicals in the body. And radicals are things that are produced that could actually destroy cells. So one would always advise eat healthy and uh, keep fit in terms of uh, uh, exercise. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you for giving that uh, response there. Okay, uh, this question, you might not have the, the, the accurate data 
Uh, but I mean, I just possibly wanted to just, you know, attempt to answer the question, uh, maybe from, um, you know, some data or some knowledge you might have. So we look at, uh, because initially you mentioned about, you know, the, the deprived areas uh, could uh, have a, an increased uh, risk of, uh, you know, having uh, cervical cancer or ovarian cancer within the population, female population to be precise. But looking at the, you know, the data as well in comparison to Africa, and I'm, I'll tell you where I'm going here, you know, I'll tell you where I'm going here. Um, if you look at the African populace or the the, the rate of uh, cervical cancer or ovarian cancer within the African population in comparison to the European, you know, population, is there is there a a, a um, comparison to be made where uh, Africa has a higher or lower or vice versa? So, you, you you just touched on a very um, you know sensitive area for me because uh, I'm from Nigeria, yeah. you know, in Africa, and the cervical cancer burden is 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 just so high, mm. okay, compared to what you had in the UK, okay, and the worst part of it is that we have seen that cervical cancer is presentable more than 99%. Because there is a program for vaccination, yeah. there is a program for screening. And these are things that are, are doable if there is a commitment to get it done. Okay? Yeah. And what we have in a lot of African countries are measures that are being taken by NGOs, you know, by private individuals, you know, by, you know, private, you know, setups to screen for cervical cancer. We're not talking about vaccination now. People are actually paying out of pocket that I'm aware of to get vaccination for their children. Wow. But you don't have a government program in place. Mm. And it's not structured where you would say, I'm going for you know, my next cervical cancer screen in the next two years, yeah. in the next three years. And the burden of, you know, of mortality, the number of deaths from cervical cancer in Africa, in Nigeria, in, you know, in different parts of Africa is, is quite high compared to what you have in, in the UK, in the rest of Europe. And it's all about having that wheel by government to put something in place, you know? Th there was a focus on HIV AIDS some years ago. Yeah. And you had a lot of testing, you had antiretrovirals, you know, because there was a political wheel. You know, the same attention should be given. I think probably over half a million women will die from cervical cancer in a year. That's a large number. It is. And most will present when the disease is already far gone to do anything reasonable, mm. you know. So if the borough leaves from what's happened in developed countries, you know, they could get a vaccination program on board. They could get a screening program on board for cervical cancer. You know, we can't do much in terms of screening for uh, ovarian cancer except to educate people about yeah. symptoms and about early presentation when they consider their family history and things like cutting down on smoking. You know, if, if one cuts down on smoking, it reduces the risk of having up to probably 15, 16 different type of cancers in a, in a lifetime. Amazing. All right. So it's important that those programs are put in place. It is. And I totally agree with you. And it's quite uh, appalling, um, you know, that the, 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 the what we have... Um, in the society is you know a lack of uh, you know incompetent and i say just just put it you know so you say they're, they're incompetent government you know not being able to provide uh, simple uh, medical care for his citizens i mean anyone listening to us who might be um in in africa uh now uh, i hope you you have been able to uh, pick up some certain uh, symptoms uh you know that you can you can you know pay attention to you know, we're talking about uh, ovarian cancer, you know, things around bloating, constipation, uh, diarrhea uh, as well. You need to, um, you know, 
have a look have a look at it have it checked out as well the earlier you get it uh, checked out the, the better uh, you, you you know you will have a chance of survival we have a question uh, from uh, one of our listeners uh, amazing uh, demoner there uh, she says if the ca125 and the scan detects ovarian cancer what are the chances of survival Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think it's an from D Mona. Thank yes. you very much. Now, uh, the CA125 and the, uh, the ultrasound scan doesn't detect the life of cancer, but if the CA125, which is a blood test, if, if, if the results are raised, then there is a consideration that this possibly could be a malignancy, it could be a cancer. And if the ultrasound scan shows a mass in the ovary, okay, then that individual gets fast-tracked for care. Okay, the diagnosis is only made when you know the tissue has been taken from the mass and then it's tested in the lab, and then you say for certain we're dealing with ovarian cancer, although the suspicion could be present. So when when there is that suspicion, then it's all about referral to the specialist and um, also in some instances the cancer center. Now, looking at survival, for women who are diagnosed quite early, then the chances of survival beyond five years is reasonable. But if it's diagnosed quite late, then surviving less than um, surviving more than five years is quite low. So it's 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 all about picking it quite early. Amazing, amazing. So you know it's been amazing. Um, I've had quite a lot of information coming through this evening uh, as well. But there's one thing I need to raise as well. We, um, especially within the black, uh, you know, community, we have this notion of. Um, not paying attention to our health, which I mentioned at yeah. the top of the show. We we love God. I love God. You know, I'm a religious person as well. You know, I'm a Christian, proud Christian to be at, uh, as that. But we have this problem of, you know, saying that, you know, God forbid, you know, this should not happen to me. Yes, mm. God forbid. But if you have the symptoms or the signs, you need to reach out and do something. I mean, Dr. Charles, what do you think? Uh, it's uh, a very sensitive one whenever you talk about religion because it all depends on the information that people have. You know, uh, the Holy Book, the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Mm. So when when people have the right information, then they know that uh, God could use uh, medical science to bring about their healing. You know, the, there were times where, you know, Jesus would say, go wash in the pool, yes. or he would spit in the mud, use it on the man's eyes, and the eyes would open, and other times he just said, be healed, and that was it. So it's, it's all about utilizing information you have. Don't be lazy about your health. Don't be presumptive, but go get information, and then you know, quote-unquote, what the enemy is, so you could better direct your prayers. That's what I would say. Amazing. Amazing. So today we learned about uh, ovarian cancer and cervical cancer. We only touched just the, you know, just the top of it, just just a little bit. We never really go went into as much, but we try to give you as much information as we could this evening. You know, going back, doing a quick, um, you know, update or you know, looking back at what we talked about today. We talked about what are the symptoms, what are the early signs. You know, for ovarian cancer, you're talking about bloating, constipation, uh, diarrhea as well. And also, if it's, it can be genetic, you know, you can be, you know, maybe your parents have had it, your mom has had it, your grandmama has had it as well. There's what we call the BRCA gene, where you can go on request for that screening to be done. So if that, you know, if it does exist, then, you know, steps can be put in place to maybe remove the ovaries if you've, you know, or the fallopian tube, if you've had all the children uh, you wanted to, or even make a decision then, at least you're aware of what you know that needs to be done dr charles said okay breastfeeding as well 
is a way to preserve, uh, preserve, uh, prevent ovarian cancer. It, it helps in lowering the risk of getting ovarian cancer. Pregnancy as well. I'm not telling you to go get pregnant. I'm just saying as well. I'm not saying, you know, after this show, uh, get your husband to say, you know, let's not get pregnant. No, that's not what you're saying. We're just telling you that, yes, this uh, can help reduce, um, you know, the ovaries ovulating and maybe causing some kind of like, you know, uh, cells just dividing uh, not in a normal way also we're talking about the cervical cancer as well hbv something that stood out to me today uh, which is a high contributor uh, possibly to cervical cancer and hbv how do you get it who knows lifestyle again smoking drinking o obesity all these factors can contribute to uh, the presence of hbv uh, around yourself uh, or within, you know, the, the reproductive system. What are the early signs of cervical cancer? We talked about bleeding. You know, when you have a sexual a sexual intercourse, and and it's bleeding, sometimes you know, if they, oh my god, it maybe because you know something happened was rough. No, if it's continually happening, you need to, uh, you know, uh, sort it out. You know, there, there's a there's a discharge that you know really really foul smell. It's not normal. Have a look at it. There's weight loss. Have a look at that. The earlier, you know, you get to have a look and seek help, the higher chance of you surviving uh, the cervical cancer. We talked about BMI. What is BMI? Uh, that's your height uh, multiplied by two and divided by your weight. You know, you can check that that online. The the loads of tools that are there uh, that you can check online. We also talk about the family planning, which is quite common. Uh, uh, you know, in all communities, because people want to, you know. Put a you know a hold on uh, children they they have at some point and they use pills you know they use uh, you know implants and also injection and you know Dr Charles said you know pills yes could contribute uh, to uh, some you know cancer type you know ovarian cancer uh, as well but again seek help uh, out there uh, to ensure you're using the right uh, you know family planning method uh, right for your body. We also talked about diet diet yes there's no definite link to that but i believe having a healthy lifestyle eating well eating healthy would definitely contribute uh, to a healthy reproductive system uh, as well i mean dr charles for anyone listening to you uh, this evening and thinking oh my gosh I'm, I'm 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 getting paranoid i'm scared i'm worried you know uh, you know what what do i need to do you know what what would you say to them you know a patient you know imagine you have all these patients in front of you now and they've, they've listened to all this we've talked about this evening, and they might be a bit worried. What would you say to them? I would say the overall risk of uh, having cancer in one's lifetime is uh, pretty low, but it's just important that one has the right information just in case there is a rainy day. So we live in hope, we enjoy life while we're here, and that we just remain grateful for life, really. Okay, remain grateful for life, uh, that is a way. But while you're remaining grateful for life uh, as well, make sure you pay attention to your body and spot the changes. The body is a, a, a wonderful uh, creation by God. It reacts to, you know, things that it seems that it's not normal and gives you those signs. Let's pay attention to those signs so we can take care of our body and have a healthy and long life. Dr. Charles, it's been amazing to have you on the show this evening. I've had such an amazing time. And I've learned quite a lot as well. And my listeners, I hope you have too. We shall be bringing back Dr. Charles um, next month again and to talk about more healthy uh, lifestyles or health uh, regarding the female reproductive uh, system. Make sure you keep it with, uh, with a date uh, with us. It's been amazing, Dr. Charles. I hope you had a great time on the show. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Dr. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic Sunday. But stay locked on, stay locked in. Got some great vibes coming your way. As you know, it's your host, Dominion, on Candid Expressing Sunday on Dominion Radio.